Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chris Halberman from Reality Mine here. Welcome to the webinar. I say good afternoon, but of course, some of you are in the US, so good morning. Some of you may even be in Asia Pac, so good evening. We're just going to wait about 30 seconds and let a few more attendees join. We had a lot of a lot of signups, but I think we I can see people still flooding in. So we're going to wait about 30 seconds and then we'll kick off. Okay, so let's get started. Um, again, welcome. Thanks for joining our webinar. Today's topic is Path to Purchase Research, Sorting the Facts from Fiction. Um, I'm delighted, as I, as I said, for those of you who literally just joined, I'm Chris Hardman, the CEO of Reality Mine. I'm delighted to be joined today on this webinar by Lindsay Parry and Kit Sanford, who are two of our clients from uh, NEPA. And we're going to spend, in fact, Lindsay and Kit are going to spend about 20 minutes going through the content on path to purchase research and how NEPA approaches it. Um, and we're gonna have some time at the end for questions. So the whole webinar should be over and done with within um, half an hour. You have access to a question or chat tab. Um, you're all on mute, those of you attending, but you can uh, pose questions. And what we will try and do is get some of those questions live at the end of the webinar. We'll also be circulating a recording of the webinar afterwards. So if you um, don't worry if you miss anything, you don't need to take notes. If you have colleagues that want to go to see the webinar or people you want to forward it to, that will be possible. We're going to try and address in a very short space of time a lot of questions that you see on the left hand tab, um, left hand of the screen. Before we do that, just a couple of words on Reality Mine and NEPA. So, Reality Mine, for those of you that don't know, we're a technology business. We've been around for about eight years now, headquartered in Manchester um, in England. We are specialists and leaders in passive metering technology. So technology that allows market research agencies to capture behavioral data on consumers. We specialize in uh, mobile devices and desktop and tablet devices. We work pretty much exclusively within the market research industry um, for a number of reasons, but, but one of the strong reasons is the um, availability of panels, GDPR compliant, opted in, often mobile panels on which we can deploy our technology for agencies. And, we work globally um, across Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. I'm now going to hand over to Lindsay from NEPA, who will introduce NEPA and, and take us into the content. Thanks, Lindsay. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Just a, a quick overview about NEPA. We're actually a Swedish company started in 2006, but we work globally uh, in most markets globally, actually, and we specialize in consulting, technology, and research, combining all three to really focus on really what's going to make the difference to your bottom line, be it in consumer research or shopper research. And we've actually been named one of the fastest growing tech companies in Sweden. And we have offices, our head offices in Stockholm, but we have offices globally. Thanks, Chris. Next slide. So just to start off the conversation, path to purchase, never more relevant than in current times. We know already that you will have lots of existing insights in the business, be it consumer insights, shopper insights, retailer insights, media insights, or social media insights, or all of the above. The key is to really understand how they all connect together. What drives a shopper through potentially all of those different touch points and channels? Which touch points are making the difference in actually helping them convert? And what role are each of them playing and therefore what is the job to be done to influence more shoppers to make more purchases, especially in these times when budgets are tight. Where are you going to get your optimum bang for buck when we consider all of those together? Next slide, please. So when, when we're doing these path to purchase studies, it, it's really important that we choose the right source of data, the right tool for the job when we're doing certain pieces of analysis. And what we know is that stated data is really good at understanding shoppers' motivations and attitudes. And even when we're asking them to recount uh, you know, a previous shopping trip from a, a day or two ago, 
but actually what we what we know and what we've proven with our path to purchase studies is that stated data is notoriously bad at measuring online behavior what we can see in this example here from one of our studies is that actually shoppers who are using amazon who were saying when they record it and when we were looking at their actual behavior we were seeing that they were overstating the use of amazon by a factor of four and that actually when it came to looking at their search engine behavior on google we were seeing that they were understating it by a factor of two so it's really important that we don't just rely on stated data when we're doing path to purchase studies to make sure that we're getting the most accurate insights. Next slide, please. Quite often, we'll get a brief from one of our clients to ask the question, how do we optimize e-commerce sales? Or how do we optimize in-store sales? Well, the truth of the matter is that actually to optimize any channel sales, we need to understand the synergy effect of all channels because we are getting a combined effect. We've done studies around the globe in different markets where perhaps the market has a predominance of in-store purchases or in a more developed market where e-commerce sales are more prevalent. But in both cases, we see web, web rooming and showrooming really taking an impact and they're alive and kicking in, in all categories and in all markets. So the two channels, digital, and offline are intrinsically linked. We see here in this example that many online purchases are researched first online, and many online purchases are also researched in store. So building a overview strategy of a connected journey of where and how you can influence consumers to shoppers online and offline is absolutely key to optimizing both e-commerce channels and in-store channels. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a real illustration of some of the results that we've seen in different categories in different markets. So, for example, where in-store in sales are still very much predominant, such as in India, Turkey, and Indonesia, and Thailand, the impact of researching online before a purchase can be as much as 50%, especially in a highly engaged category. But it's still, even for something like refreshments, which is perhaps less engaged in Turkey, up to 25% of purchases being researched online first before making a purchase decision in store. And for more developed markets where e-commerce sales are perhaps more prevalent, such as the UK, the US, France, etc., this pattern still holds true. So absolutely looking at a combined channel strategy is absolutely key to drive the optimum amount of sales and conversions. Next slide please. So going back to Kit's slide about understanding what behaviours are happening online and the motivations associated with them and indeed the motivations and decision makings that are happening in store, we need to pick the right tool for the right job. We need to pick the right data for the right job. So we need to understand actual behavior and stated data over an entire purchase cycle. Looking at a methodology at a single point in time isn't enough. We need to take into account a longitudinal study that takes into account, for example, different purchase cycles and paydays, et cetera, so that we truly understand the pre-shop and the in-shop decision-making and behaviours. Next slide, please. And this is exactly what we're aiming to do with our prior departure studies, is bring together these two sources of data. So I'll come on to talk about this in a bit more detail later, but we have a quantitative diary where we are able to capture our, well, things like triggers and barriers, attitudes towards certain aspects of the path of purchase, um, brand and product awareness and consideration, as well as any segmentation that might be useful to integrate within these path of purchase studies. And we bring that together with uh, actual digital behavioral data uh, provided through Reality Minds technology. So with this, we're able to capture some really rich online behaviors. So we're able to see exactly what shoppers were viewing um, or were browsing within their um, browsers on 
different platforms, so both on desktop and on mobile. And beyond that, we're actually able to see inside some really important apps, um, such as Amazon, to understand the path of purchase that's happening within the app, um, as well as certain streaming apps to understand what media and TV our shoppers are consuming, as well as seeing within some of the walled gardens like Instagram and Facebook to understand the ad exposure that is happening within our or during our studies um, for our shoppers. Next slide, please. And as you can imagine, this creates a wealth of data, a huge, huge data source of um, both behavioral and attitudinal data. And there's a real complex job of knitting this data together. And even once you have done that, the path of purchase itself is a complex web to analyze. And what we've been doing at NEP over the past three years is pulling together a rigorous process for how we integrate those data sources, but then actually how we model those data sources so that we can understand the exact power of each individual touch point in driving sale and where it is most effective within the shopping journey. Next slide, please. And it's, it's really, really important that we have both of these data sources together in one place under one roof because we can't just look at e-commerce alone or in-store alone. We know that these two, two things interplay and that one influences the one influences the other. So we might see that someone is researching online and purchasing in store, or that actually someone is purchasing um, something or in store and something that they see there influences their online research or purchase behavior. So making sure that this data is really organized and integrated so that we can do this is paramount. Next slide, please. So what do we actually get from organizing this data and being able to analyze it together? Well, we're able to look at a very granular level, at, at very granular touch points, both on and offline, and understand their relative conversion power, uh, as well as the frequency in which they're appearing to understand actually what is driving my purchase. And not only can we do this um, just at a total level, in this example here, uh, that we've we've picked for you is actually showing the online um, conversion power. So actually, the what's driving the online sales, and you can see that the top three conversion points here are all in store. So it's really important that we're able to analyze both these sources of data to make sure that we can see exactly which touch point is driving the sale. Next slide, please. And that's just thinking about uh, you know, one specific category or one specific market, but actually thinking about how we can analyze across markets. What we can see here is that actually, even within the same category, we can compare and contrast those touch points. And in this example, we can see that actually for this category, we're seeing that in-shop is the key driver across all of these markets. So there's a global truth that actually in-store seems to be the top driving conversion point for this category. But actually when it comes to the next few conversion points, we're seeing that there are uh, both pre-shop and combination touch points which are driving purchase beyond that. Next slide, please. So an ideal outcome is really a solution that gives you a toolkit of levers. Number one is really to understand the different conversion power, the relative different conversion powers when you put both online and offline touch points on a level playing field. Which ones are giving you the best bang for buck? Second one is which ones are reaching the most consumers and shoppers? And the third one is what's the relative cost? So by understanding the level playing field across both online and offline touch points, you can really start to choose do I need to dial up the effectiveness of conversion, convert, uh, converting touch points by better content, better offers, better price, better targeting? Do I need to extend my investment to reach more uh, end user audiences? And do I need to offset that against the cost of my different media and touch points? 
Next slide, please. One of the key things as well is that we definitely shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This should be about connecting the dots of the existing frameworks you already have in the business. It's about creating one language across the business, be it consumer insights or usage occasion insights, be it shopper personas, consumption segments, retail customer insights, channel insights, whatever it might be, this is about connecting the dots of how those different frameworks play out in a real life path to purchase. And therefore, where can we influence and how can we influence to drive conversion for different target audiences? Next slide, please. So what that should really enable you is to give you the breadth and depth of data to build on your existing frameworks at a retailer level, at a demographic level, at a market level, at a product format level, by understanding some of the things on the left-hand side. So what are the levers that you can then start to dial up or dial down? How different does your strategy look if you're considering driving impulse purchases, for example? How different does your strategy look when you take into account what content you need to play to researching behavior to influence the pre-shop decision-making before people are in shop, whether, it, whether that be in an e-commerce site or in a physical store. Next slide, please. So when we put those building blocks together, what that should really enable you to have is a playbook that identifies where to play and how to win across all of those different touch points. Where to play, where should I invest by channel and by touch point that is really going to drive either increased penetration, increased growth, etc. How to win, what are the decisions and motivations that are driving those purchases at different points along that journey? What is the right content? What are the research behaviors? What are the messages that are converting? Who are they converting with? And what are the right uh, shoppers to be targeting at different points along that purchase journey. By understanding the breadth and depth of data that we saw in the previous slide and building those blocks together with your existing frameworks, you can really start to get into the specifics of how and where you can increase penetration, how and where you can appeal to different segments, where you can steal share from, what the online effect is, of uh, different impacts of web rooming and showrooming, for example, et cetera. So any methodology really enables, should enable you to have that winning playbook to work at both a strategic level, but also at a very detailed granular level as well. Next slide, please. So that's all great in theory, but what are the real impacts? So we've got a couple of case study examples of different uh, scenario outputs that came out of the studies. So here in this study in the US, one of the key objectives was to understand the right mix. Where do I get my best bang for buck? And what is the job to be done by different touch points and different channels? So very simply here, we have shown an illustration of how we've mapped conversion power of touch points versus the reach of different touch points. The far top right hand box where you've got high conversion power and high observation frequency are really your must haves. The bottom right hand box where you've got a lower conversion power and higher observation frequency, it's really about driving the effectiveness of those touch points. Potentially the offer isn't as strong as it could be or the content that you're showing online isn't as strong as it could be. Bottom left, probably up for a review and top left, well, you've got low observation frequency, but high conversion power. So probably the investment there is to extend the reach and invest more in getting more shoppers and consumers to really see what you're putting out there. Now that's a very simplistic overview, but hopefully you can start to see the power of when you overlay that against the, the cost of those different touch points and the cost of the implementations, you can start to see about how a playbook of where to play can be formed. Next slide, please. Here is another output that could come out of the path to purchase. This is around 
really creating a very targeted retailer selling strategy. So in this particular example, looking at spirits purchases in the US market, we identified with one of the key opportunities is around social occasions and the decision making and the opportunity to uptrade when it comes to that particular mindset. One of the key behaviors that we measured was that people were going online first to research very simple recipes online, how to make a simple gin and tonic, for example. Nothing fancy, just the basics. So one of the recommendations was that that content needed to be very succinctly targeted for shoppers of this particular retailer online first. It then needed to be replicated in store using the same brand assets so that they could quickly identify, ah, this is the product I need, this is the recipe I was looking for. But by building a granular selling story, understanding the entire path to purchase and the opportunities for this particular retailer, we were also able to create the ROI case for doing that and building in this online and in-store execution. Next slide, please. So I'm thinking that many of you might be thinking, well, that's all great. Either that sounds incredibly hard or hasn't this been around for a while and isn't this something we all should be doing or are doing? So let's just debunk some of the myths that may uh, be out there. Next slide, please. So, so how do we actually run one of these path to purchases? Uh, how do we make it easy? Um, well, I think the first thing to say is uh, um, it, it perhaps hasn't been so easy in the past, but we've been through a process over the past three years to make it easy. Um, and we boiled it down into a few components, which I'll take you through now. Um, firstly, I'll talk about how we find the audience. So we, we partnered with a few um, choice panel providers um, who are used to running these studies with us uh, so that we can find the right audience. And when we're running these studies, we, we make sure that we're aiming for a minimum of a thousand respondents to make sure that we can really have a robust sample to do all the analysis that we've spoken about so far but often it can be north of this to make sure that we get more granular results um, and can go into the level of deta detail needed. Once we found our audience, we ask our participants to uh, take part in our study. We let them know how we're going to run the study and we ask them to install Reality Minds technology either on their desktop or mobile or both devices so that we're able to see their browsing behavior throughout the study. And then throughout the study, we start collecting the data. We're collecting the, the passive metering data and also the diary data, um, uh, at which point we'll come on to analyze it. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the structuring and analysis, breaking it down into, into three key components. First of all, we've got our data sources. So we've spoken a lot about the passive metering data that we've got. We also have uh, the diary data, and this diary data is a quantitative diary that we're asking our participants to fill out every few days so that we capture the online, uh, the, sorry, the offline behaviors as well as the attitudes and motivations towards their shopping. We also ask uh, triggered surveys throughout the, sur throughout the study, and this will be based on certain behaviors that we're seeing throughout the study. So if there's something of of real interest that we want to dig into in terms of that, that behavioral what data, then we can ask why in our triggered surveys. And once we've got these two data sources coming through, we go through a rigorous process of integrating this data uh, and what we call path creation. And this is again, being something along with our modeling that we've honed over the past few years to make sure that we're creating the right length path for the right category and the right market. And that we're taking things into account like overlapping paths, which, which often happens when you're creating uh, paths out of these, these complex web of interactions. And one of the outputs from this uh, data source that we're creating is uh, a data source that allows us to model our path to purchase. And we can do this at a category level um, but we can break this down further into subcategories, uh, into channels, retailers, or even brands, depending on uh, the, the sample size we have. 
providing we have sample, our modeling approach will work there too. It's not just the modeling uh, data that comes out of this. We, we also create a few other sources of data um, uh, to understand both more granular purchase and trip behaviors to create many more rich insights from our path to purchase studies. And that, that's it from my side. I'm just gonna hand back to Chris to talk more about actually the, the behavioral data and what reality mind do to, to take it from a, a raw phase into something that's um, something that ends up in our FTP. Great, thanks, thanks Kit. So this is the final slide before we move on to questions. Um, as, as Kit said, I just wanted to talk briefly about the passive data. I think um, Lindsay mentioned complexity of these studies, and I think it's fair to say that in the past, um, using passive data has proved quite challenging for many um, agencies in the marketplace. Kit's focused, Kit and Lindsay have focused on the insight box, the sort of orangey red box on the top right um, of this screen, but of course, Beneath that, on the behavioral data side, we have a, a, a process of collecting data, and it's worth understanding what has improved there in recent years. I think we've really reached the point where there's a clear market need for um, omni-channel insights for all the reasons that we know. Equally, we've had a maturing of the technology, and Reality Mind has been at the forefront of that. I think one of the first things has been respondent experience. So it wasn't too long ago that you, know, you as a respondent on a panel signing up to being metered wasn't necessarily a completely smooth and pain-free process. You might have issues with things like battery life and those issues have been dramatically improved over time. So now the, the process of onboarding a panel is actually very um, relatively painless. And so we can achieve high retention through the longitudinal period of study. The second thing is I think it's um, incumbent on us as a technology, technology provider to put data in the hands of our clients that's ready to use. So Reality Mind has spent a lot of time, a lot of effort over the last three, four years on data processing, algorithms, taxonomies, so that we can really put data in the hands of someone like Kit and, and he's able to get going rather than spending literally days or weeks uh, cleansing the data itself. We've also had the emergence and growth of panels um, that aren't just online panels, but they're, they're mobile panels with things like dedicated uh, native mobile apps on Android and iOS. That for us is a perfect vehicle for deploying our technology via an SDK. So the technology is actually within the app and then you have a unified um, brand experience for the panelist. And I think the other thing to, that is always worth uh, mentioning these days is GDPR. I think whether we're working with clients in the EU or outside the EU, we, we maintain a strict GDPR compliant uh, methodology. So panelists understand very clearly, um, given the, the potential privacy concerns here, what am I what am I signing up to? What data is being collected from my devices? How is it being processed and stored? And so on. So that takes us to the end of the, the content. Um, we've had a few questions come in. So we're gonna, I'm gonna put a couple of questions now to, to Lindsay and Kit. I'm just looking through through what's come in. If you have uh, if we're not able to answer your questions and we won't be able to do all of them. Um, you can see the email address is on the screen. As I said, we will follow up by email and distribute you a copy of this so you can follow up directly with any of us on any particular aspect that, that may interest you. So first question I'm gonna pick on is, is one that says, so what about non-FMCG um, categories and industries? Can the same methodology apply um, across uh, different, different categories and industries? Um, Lindsay or Kit, can you pick that up? Hi, yes. Absolutely. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, and I think the, the key here is that, uh, for example, retailers, telecoms companies, media companies will probably have a wealth of transactional data already. Fantastic. Let's feed that into the model. That really stands as one of those existing frameworks that we were talking about. What this allows us to do is understand the world beyond your current universe, the universe that a consumer or a customer has with you. So it's absolutely applicable to all industries that really want to understand how a customer or a consumer has reached them, who they're competing with, with their share of wallet or share of mind, and where they can really start to influence them to either retain them or to increase growth. So absolutely, uh, this is be beyond FMCGs. Uh, this is entirely relevant for, for all industries. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. And have you done longitudinal studies where you can observe changes over time? And I guess that triggers a question in my mind, which is, and what about with COVID-19? 
you know, are we starting to see the emerging impact of that um, in some of the work that you're doing? So that's a great question. The, the reason um, that obviously we're looking at longitudinal studies is that we know that particularly uh, when we're observing different behaviours, perhaps buying for different needs in that purchase cycle, uh, be it a social occasion or an everyday occasion, you really want to understand the different motivations of that same uh, individual uh, to see what the different interplays are. So that's the reason for the longitudinal study. Are we seeing different behaviours? Yes, absolutely. So we've seen, for example, an emergence of proximity shopping, people actually shopping much more locally to them. We've also seen, particularly in markets like the US, where people are actually traveling out of town to much bigger box stores so that they don't really have to impact or interact with other uh, shoppers, for example. Um, obviously, the emergence of e-commerce, we've all uh, turned to e-commerce uh, during these times, but also the importance of pre-shop research. Even if you are purchasing in store, we see that a lot of uh, people are doing research online beforehand, so they know exactly what they're buying, when they're buying it, why they're buying it, and can get in and get out. So those are, it, it's really created a, um, a much more um, uh, diversified set of shopping behaviours. Uh, whether those continue beyond the immediate impact of COVID, we'll have to wait and see. But of course, then on the horizon is potentially global recession, which will again bring different behaviours. So longitudinal studies really equip you for creating a strategy that's got longevity. Okay, great. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I think we're actually up, we're slightly over time, so we have got more questions. What we will try and do, if you've identified yourself, we will, um, I think, follow up directly with you, if that's okay. Um, but we'll end here. Thank you all for um, attending and listening. And as I said, if you want any follow-up at all, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you have the email addresses, you have our details, and we'll go from there. Thanks, and have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks.